Americans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a good bead on things. Uh, well, why, why the big secret? People are smart. They can handle it. The person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. And 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. Imagine what you know tomorrow. We don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. A group of social criminals, these people in the space program, nassholes I call them. And some of those people actually still believe the Earth is flat. Uh, so if a few of them want to believe that we didn't go to the moon, let them. Uh, it's not an issue that comes up in my presentation. Uh, you well, don't. well, I mean, the, I mean, the, I mean, the Earth being flat—that that's clearly ridiculous. Though I've actually been contacted by some flat earthers saying I'm covering up the fact that it's it's some Atlantean conspiracy. Atlantean conspiracy. NASA. As you can see, we got a nice red serpent tongue coming through there. NASA. And there's the UN flag. Also the symbol of the flat earth. Oh, of course, if I say flat earth, then I gotta be an idiot. Wait. That's what they told you, right? That's all. There's no Antarctica in this. <laughs> Hold out here. Yeah, it is. It's like the South Pole. It's like the deep South Pole. If there was one, there isn't, though. No. The Peters projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? It's where you've been living this whole time. The legislature recognize that there is a debate about whether critical the Earth thinking. is round or flat. No, no, no. And you let's encourage critical thinking by saying there should be a legitimate debate between whether the Earth is round or flat. Because after all, any idiot can walk outside We're and, look and see We're it's flat. This. this is very important what we're fighting for. Because I'm tired, I'm really, really tired of the manipulation. They do not tell the truth. They're lying. Hey, 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 hey. The history books are not true. It's a lie. That's why my fault. The history books are lying. You need to know that. You must know that. Steroid Santa Claus kicks and deals. It's a long fly ball going back, back. And the ball shatters the sky, bringing the ocean itself down into the stadium. Oh, Simpson just broke this dream's reality wide open. You know, there's be some comedians making jokes tonight, but uh, I want to talk about the joke that's on you. German cartographer, Mercator, originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. So it makes it easier to cross an ocean. But yes. it distorts the relative size of nations and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh dear, yes. Uh, look at Greenland. Okay. Now look at Africa. Okay. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Would it blow your mind if I told you that Africa is in reality 14 times larger? Yes. Here we have Europe drawn considerably larger than South America. When it's 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska appears three times as large as Mexico, when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, wait, wait. Relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing's where you think it is. Where is it? I'm glad you asked. 
Okay, so here's the, uh, the picture of the Earth from, uh, from space. There it is. Since you were a kid, you've seen this image. But uh, you've never seen it from that point of view. You know what? We adopted this whole model like four or five hundred years before the airplane. Four hundred years before the airplane, pretty much. It was like, what, like beginning of the 1900s? They went to the North Pole in the 1900s. This is 1482. Nobody went to the top of the globe, to the bottom, or flew up, or built a skyscraper until, it's funny, back in the 60s when, when they went to the moon, this is the first time we actually had like an instrument of flight to actually go high enough to actually fucking check out if what we agreed to 500 years ago was real. So if they were wrong after 500 years, the question is, would they tell you? 1969, first lunar mission to the moon. You know, the first lunar mission to the moon wasn't so much about going to the moon. It was about having an event so you can go high enough to take a picture after 500 years to prove it was a ball. <laughs> And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Mr. Armstrong, Bart Several, ABC Digital, wanted to give you the opportunity to swear in the Bible that you walked on the moon. The two most watched televised events in history, the moon landing and the towers falling. You have $5,000 cash. You can give it to charity if you swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon. Please I have a tape. Sure. That'd be fine. Why don't you swear to... Why not? Why won't you do it? And it's funny when you click on Google Images, photo of the Earth, you see, you'll see 40 pages on Google. But it's always the same fucking photo. For those that believe in the Bible, the Bible does mention the edges of the Earth, the four corners of the Earth, and how Satan brought Jesus Christ to the top of the mountain and showed him all kingdoms of the world. How can Satan show Jesus all kingdoms of the world if the world is round? How can there be edges of the world if the world's a sphere? The Bible also mentions how the earth is immovable and is set on pillars. So for the believers, that still believe in the ball earth, the round earth, got to reconsider, according to science and the satanic system, the earth is supposedly tilted at a 23.4 degree angle off vertical. And that leaves you at 66.6 .6 degrees off horizontal. Now what are the chances of that? Moon landing, 8.17 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1969. Isaac Newton, 1666. 666, my Most people saw the lunar landing and they swear on it because they heard it on the radio. <laughs> CBS put up screens all over Central Park, along with NBC, you know, so they could work with Group think dynamics. Reality is reinforced by group dynamics. What you see in the uh, the zero g illusion also that you see astronauts uh, they look like they're floating or flying in space. It's achieved through three different ways. 
one way is through zero g planes uh, they're just boeing 737s specially outfitted to do these parabolic maneuvers where they they do a, a parabolic and then you have a zero g like free fall state where it seems like you're floating for about a minute at a time you can keep this this going um, the second way when they're like at the fake international space station uh, fixing things outside of it this is done in a pool in a dark pool they're actually underwater um, and you can see bubbles rising out of the pool uh, oh. proving that they're in a pool in many of their spacewalks uh, so, so the outside space shots are done in the pool the inside uh, most of the inside shots are done in zero-g planes and then some of the longer inside shots are done with a green screen and harnesses so they just kind of float on a harness in front of a green screen and with these three methods they're able to produce the um, zero-g effect that everybody thinks is uh, them floating around in space uh, but in reality uh, anything that goes up comes right back down there is no point where you can just go up 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 and then Oh, I'm floating now, and I get to float through infinite space now forever. That's the illusion. That doesn't happen. You will always come back to the Earth. You'll always fall right back down. No matter how high you go up? As high as, high as any non-NASA source has gone. an official NASA photo of the first Apollo 11 lunar module landing on the moon. I mean, it's right there. This is the proof, man. It's the picture's right there. It's landing on the moon. But the only problem I have with this picture is that it's taken from the moon. <laughs> I don't know what the big deal was with being the first guy on the moon. Uh, it seems the camera crew was already there. <laughs> hey. All right. Do you see Photoshop? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And if those of you think this technical difficulty was planned and think I'm scamming you, go do it for yourself. <laughs> I'm going to zoom in on the Earth in Photoshop. Do you see the Earth? Yep. Okay. I'm going to go to Image, Adjust, Levels, and I'm going to bring the levels over here. And I'm going to bring the levels up. Uh-oh. What is that? Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. Why is there a square box around the Earth allegedly taken from the scientists on the moon in Apollo 17? Then you got other pictures like this, the blue marble, right, that, are, that have come out. Okay, well, there's a big problem with the blue marble, and I'm going to zoom in here and show you what the problem is. These are all composite images where they are really not very good at Photoshop because they're using the Photoshop clone tool to replicate clouds. This is an official photo from NASA. But plus, how many people think that's a photo? But plus, how many people think this is bullshit? Now, a lot of people's first question is going to be, well, where's the edge? And I was surprised to uh, see how easy that is to rectify, but it, I'm sure you get that a lot. How do you tell people when they come at you with, well, where's the edge? Why aren't people sailing off the edge or whatever? So in the flat Earth model, the North Pole is in the middle and the Earth is a disk shape and the Antarctica is all the way around holding the oceans in. And so it's a fact if you're at the North Pole and you go south, no matter which uh, actually, it doesn't matter where you are. If you go south, eventually, you're going to end up in Antarctica. But on the ball model, it's just a little ice continent underneath the ball. Yet in this model, it's all the way around you, holding the oceans in. As for whether there's an edge beyond the Antarctic ice plateau, this wall that holds everything in is about 100 to 200 feet tall. And once you climb up on the ice wall, it's a plateau of snow that just goes on and on and on. Uh, and the public and myself are ignorant at the moment as to whether it, there is an edge at some point, whether there'd be a barrier, a dome, uh, as 
that many ancient cultures have said there is, or whether it's an infinite flat plain and it's just snow, ice, wind, and darkness forever. Please stop what you're doing and listen. This is not a drill. your poisons from spreading, your government has sealed you all within this dome. Go, run! Our best guess puts the dome at 20,000 feet, sir. Did he just call it a dome? You think we might be stuck in here a while? I think that even if what's wrong suddenly becomes right, the army's just gonna quarantine this place. I want roving death squads around the perimeter 24-7. I want 10,000 tough guys to... Let me out! Let me out! I wanna... What's the most resilient parasite? An idea. A single idea from the human mind can build cities. An idea can transform the world and rewrite all the rules. Which is why I have to steal it. Never recreate from your memory. Always imagine new places. He's hiding something and we need to find out what that is. We gotta break out of here. In the kick! This was not a part of the plan! Is the whole flat Earth um, idea is that a uh, a new idea? How long has this been around? No, the flat Earth was worldwide for thousands of years um, before this spinning ball Earth came around. The first person to think of the spinning ball Earth was also uh, the first Freemason, Pythagoras of Samos. Most Freemasons uh, trace their um, ancestry of a fuel back to Pythagoras as being the first Freemason. Um, and that was 2,500 years ago. But his idea didn't catch on at all until about 500 years ago when Copernicus, another Freemason and Jesuit, uh, wrote his book um, promoting this spinning ball earth and uh, concept. And then Kepler and Newton and Galileo, they took it from there. And now NASA and um, RASA and all the other space agencies, they're experts like Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson. They're continuing this heliocentric spinning ball earth gravity myth that's been going on for 500 years and they keep adding on to it now now you've got a big bang and evolution and aliens and come out and say they've found life on other planets soon they've already given us fake pictures from mars claiming that uh, there's a pyramid and sphinx on mars trying to cement this alien progenitor propaganda into us so are you saying there are no aliens not in the sense of extraterrestrials, since there are no extraterrestrial places. Earth is the only material plane. It's a plane, not a planet. And the planets are just stars. That what we call planets today were known for thousands of years as the wandering stars. They differ from the fixed stars in their relative motions only. Uh, all the fixed stars and the constellations, they, they're fixed together in, in uh, their patterns as they revolve around the heavens. But the planets, as they're called now, uh, used to be known as wandering stars because they seem to wander their own unique paths. Um, they just spiral around the sun and they have kind of a spirograph orbit uh, 
uh, you can see in one of my videos called the ancient flat earth beliefs a model of it uh, to give you an idea but with the naked eye or with a telescope you can see for yourself that these so-called planets are just stars they're just lights in the night sky they claim that the planets are physical terra firma that you can land on and potentially live on and they also claim that the stars are distant suns in galaxies trillions of light years away now, these light years are things that they've come up with to try and convince you that those lights in the sky aren't as close as they actually are they want you to think that the nearest star is actually 25 trillion mile uh, a trillion miles away and the, the reason they have to say this is because you can prove for yourself in your backyard with a telescope that the earth is motionless if we're really spinning around the sun uh, 200 million miles every six months uh, we would be on the other side of the sun right so you can by looking at the parallax change in the stars see whether that's true and there's not an inch in parallax change in any of the stars after six months of supposed orbital motion around the sun. So if that's the case, it's proof that we haven't moved. See how the moon travels at the same speed and direction as the stars. They all move together as one, and that's not possible if you believe the official narrative that the moon is a lot closer to the Earth than the stars. They'd all be moving at different speeds. This is the camera, is the Earth. And there's no way that those stars would move at the same speed and trajectory as the uh, as the moon. Why why all this deception? So what we've got now is a godless big bang, a a nothing for no reason in no time exploded and created everything. And then a bit of the everything turned into self-replicating bits and life spontaneously created and order and intelligence and consciousness all came into existence. Uh, so we've got this cosmology that comes from nothing. It's atheistic. It's nihilistic. It makes it, makes it as though humanity and earth and everything here is just a cosmic accident. It's purposeless. It's meaningless. Uh, that's why this kind of atheistic materialism is rampant nowadays because this kind of metaphysics is what we're being taught um, so if you know if we're just on, in the corner of some galaxy and the fingertip under the dust of <laughs> the fingertip of of the universe then, then you know we don't mean anything so what it does is it spiritually crushes humanity so that we just think that um, you know me, me, me is all that's important because this life is meaningless, God doesn't exist, we're just a bunch of primordial soup that turned into monkeys and then monkeys turned into humans, you know, they, they got us believe in just a bunch of nonsense. The, the overall reason, if, if you're a psychopath, like the people who do control this world all are, then what you want, your, your ultimate goal is world domination. The best way to achieve world domination is through propaganda and mind control. So the way to mind control someone, if you've got them in a cage since birth, you tell them that the cage is the only thing there is, and everywhere else you can't go. You can't go to the North Pole, and you can't go to the Antarctic without government approval and licensing. They have little tours where you can go and take little photo ops, but you can't go yourself and explore what's actually at the North Pole. Maybe I'm being set up for something. Christoph, why do you think that uh, Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now? We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. Get away. See some of the world. Explore. I like to be an explorer, like the Great Magellan. Oh, well, you're too late. There's really nothing left to explore. Who you want to be an explorer? This will pass. We all think like this now and then. They're pretending to tell me what's happening! You had to shut her down. Thank you for your help. You're welcome, Truman. Locked at every turn. They go around the block. They come back. They go around again. Meryl! You're part of this, aren't you? You are scaring me! You're scaring me, Meryl. If his was more than just a vague ambition, he was absolutely determined to 
discover the truth, there's no way we could prevent it. Christoph, I'd just like to say one thing. You're a liar and a manipulator, and what you've done to Truman is sick. Well, we remember this voice, don't we? How could we forget? Sylvia, you think because you batted your eyes that Truman once flirted with him, that you know him, that you know what's right for him? Maybe I'm losing my mind. I've been your best friend since we were seven years old, Truman that feeling when it's like everything's slipping away and the point is I would gladly step in front of traffic for you Truman. Truman, where are you going? You really think you're in a position to judge him? What right do you have to take a baby and, and, and turn his life into some kind of mockery? Don't you ever feel guilty? That's the best you can do! You're gonna have to kill me! I have given Truman the chance to lead a normal life. The world, the place you live in, is the sick place. D. Haven is the way the world should be. He's not a performer, he's a prisoner. Look at him, look at what you've done to him. you really is that ultimately Truman prefers his cell as you call it. Well, that's where you're wrong. You're so wrong, and he'll prove you wrong. Hi. Hi. I'm Dave. And I'm a fat <laughs> I've been globe free now for five years. <laughs> <laughs> Have we got the picture yet? <coughs> okay, so uh, I've been doing a little series of um, videos uh, called Flat Earth 101, where I've, I kind of delve into uh, a particular topic and just like try and cover it um, comprehensively. So um, I think I, the first one was called The Hunt for the Curvature, yeah? And the second one was called uh, The Gravity of Dropity. So this one is, is actually called uh, The Spinning Orbiting Hurtling Earth. Okay, so I'm gonna be uh, talking about Earth's motion. And to um, go on about what uh, Gary was telling, um, talking about, um, whenever I go in, into an airport, I will not go through their, you know, scan thingy, bastard thingy, right? Because, um, not only because of the backscatter radiation that they're, they're sort of dousing you with, which they will tell you, it, no, it doesn't, it doesn't harm you in the slightest. Yeah, it's, it's less powerful than your, your mobile phone. We know how bad the mobile phones are anyway. Right? The main reason that I do not, um, consent to these, uh, these scanners is because if everybody in, who, in the airport did the same as me, they'd have to get rid of those scanners, right? So I, I stand there and I kick up a fuss very loudly. I get them, the, the supervisor, the manager out there, and uh, I kick up a fuss. I um, inevitably end up being groped by the, uh, the local homosexual. <laughs> But, you know, and I'll make sure my body language, yeah, you touch something you don't do. Right? But I make, sure, I make sure they know that I'm not putting up with it. And if, if one person sees me do that and decides to do the same, yeah, hopefully more people would do it. Because we're, we're sleepwalking into the end of the world. Seriously, yeah? People, I just watched all these sheep behind me just, just go, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and, and I was told, um, you know, during this process 
that um, from next year or 2021, it's going to be mandatory. You're going to have no choice. Yeah, you are going to have no choice but to be irradiated every time you fly. That's what I'm standing up for. So, right. I'm going to <laughs> The spinning orbiting hurtling Earth. Now, the thing about um, this whole flat Earth thing is that you've got two opposing views, two absolutely opposite views, but they're identical. Yeah? When you look at them, they're identical. So it's just like this. Yeah, if you look at that, you just glance at that, you can either see the train going into the tunnel or out of it. Yeah? But if you just change your mindset a second, now it's going the other way. Can you see that? That's because you've got very limited information, yeah? Just a few frames being repeated over and over, and there's no difference between the two. It's just your, your mindset that's deciding one way or the other, okay? Um, and it's just the same as if you're on a train, and, in one of the tra and uh, there's a train next to you, one of the trains starts moving. Now there's a case to be said for, you know, either your train moving or the other train moving, okay? Without some independent outside reference point, there's no way to tell between the two, okay? Now that's the same with the flat earth and the round earth um, idea because it's only a philosophy that gives you um, one view over the other, yeah? They've given you this, this idea of, uh, you know, this huge cosmology and you add that to this idea that, you know, it could go either way, and now you've got a bias towards one and not the other. <clears throat> so I'm going to be, maybe I'll, be, I'll highlight the, the uh, times when you've got a, a train situation, okay? <clears throat> so this is my favourite um, physicist, and I didn't know I had to start this manually. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> Th then we com well, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compare to experiment or experience compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. <coughs> if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make any difference how smart you are who made the guess, or what his name is. <laughs> if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. <laughs> So that's it. I mean, that, that says it all there. If it, if it disagrees with experiment or observation or experience, it's wrong. I say, so kind of keep that in mind um, as we go through this. This uh, was from George Ellis, who's uh, a famous cosmo cosmologist, and it was echoed by um, Sir Fred Hoyle, who's the astronomer royal. He said that um, I can construct you a, symmetrically, uh, sim a spherically symmetrical universe with Earth as its centre, and you cannot disprove it based on observations. Which means that the heliocentric model and the geocentric model are identical. It's another train. Okay? They're identical, and it's just philosophy, as he, I think he says here, using, um, using a philosopher. Uh, philos philosophical approach that, uh, that you know, distinguishes between the two, okay? Um, so, you can see here, here are the two models. Now, the uh, heliocentric, okay, is identical to the geocentric, right? If you focus on the sun there, it moves that, but again, if you focus on the sun in that model, it's exactly the same model. Right? It's just, again, a philosophy that says one is different from the other, but they're the same. So we're told that the motion of the stars is what proves that the Earth is rotating. And this is interesting. This, um, 
This video is from, uh, um, I think it's like Argentina or somewhere <coughs> right down on the, uh, um, at the tip of South America. And you can see it's uh, <laughs> rotating anti-clockwise, but the center is way below the horizon, which is what you kind of expect. But the, and in a minute, it's gonna sort of flip around, the camera's gonna move around. And you only catch it for a, for a moment, but uh, any second now, it's gonna flip around, the, it's gonna change and it's gonna turn around and you'll see it rotating you know, so viewed down to the southern hemisphere. Um, and he said, now, he says. Come on. <laughs> right. So now the camera's moving. And you only catch it for a, for a short term amount of time. But again, the, the axis of rotation is down near the horizon. This is down, you know, way down south. So you only catch it for a second, but it's like down there and the, at the near the, the the horizon. So how can that be? Because um, where we are, okay, um, when you look up at the North Star, it's like up there from where we are, okay. So you should see the same from the southern side. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Funny that, isn't it? Anyway, so the motion of the stars is what we're told. Um, proves that the Earth is rotating, and I've said this before that um, you know Earth's um, axis is always always seems to be pointing at uh, at uh, Polaris, and the thousand mile per hour spin of the Earth is what's causing the stars to look like they're they're moving around us. But any small change in in Earth's position would mean that the you know, the, the pole would not po point to uh, Polaris, which is two quadrillion miles away. Okay, so isn't the Earth supposed to be moving around the Sun? Yeah, that would constitute a bit of a change. But fair enough. If um, if I'm standing looking at some stars that are two quadrillion miles away, if I move in this plane of mo motion, then the stars wouldn't look like they're moving. You know, just like when you're on a train and uh, there are mountains off in the distance. You know, you can look at the mountains and they'll, they'll hardly move. Fair enough. But that's only in one plane of motion. You know, if I was to look at the stars and move in a different plane of motion, well, the stars disappear. Or a different plane of motion, the stars disappear. Right? But here we are. Yes, we're moving in one plane of motion, but the pole is off-center. So you combine those two, you're getting a, another movement in a different plane of motion. So, I don't know, again, if that makes any sense either. But the sun is also moving. And we're going to, going to have a look at the sun's motion. Now, a lot of you have seen this. Yeah, but uh, the, the planets are corkscrewing around the sun. So, again, imagine that the Earth, one of those, uh, one of those planets, is tilted on this, on this plane of motion, right, away, and it's all corkscrewing as well. How can it possibly continue to point to Polaris? But this isn't the whole story. He says, the sun is also corkscrewing through the universe, yeah? Now, I don't know if you remember um, back in uh, 2012, that was the supposedly the, the time the, uh, the sun moved across the plane of the ecliptic. Does everybody remember that? Oh, come on, wake up. It's, I know it's uh, after lunch. But, so the sun is going up and down. So it can't literally just go up and down. It's, and it can't do a sine wave motion. There's no physics for that. The only thing it can be doing is this corkscrew motion. Okay? So, how are we getting star trails like this? It's only accounting for one motion, and it's the slowest out of all the, all the other motions. This is impossible from, from their model. This is what they, they're also telling us is happening, yeah? That, uh, you know, it's that the stars are static, and it's the Earth moving. Again, this is one of those trains, yeah? Which one's moving, okay? But, who, who thinks this is ridiculous? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. So, so apparently 
this is what they're saying is actually happening. Um, but we have some experimental proof that this isn't what's happening. And so I've attached the whole setup to this is Rob the tractor, which I've blue tacked to the table, and I've blue tacked the, the actual um, the frame to the table there for as well. A so this here is the. I'll stop you there for a second. He's um, he's using a gyroscope. Um, now a gyroscope has a, a property called rigidity in space. So once it's set spinning in a particular orientation, it will stay there, regardless of anything, regardless of where it is on Earth, um, how it's oriented to the centre of the Earth, or, or whatever. It's rigid in space. Okay. So the idea is, if if you set a gyroscope spinning, and uh, you know you set it down on, a, on your tabletop, well, if the Earth is moving round, well, the gyroscope will stay rigid in space and appear to move. You know, because the Earth is apparently moving. Okay, got it? Yeah. Yeah. Got it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, for crying out loud. So I'll just restart. Well, not restart, I'll carry the on. angle that we're looking for. <coughs> so what we're looking for is this effect. See how the gyro wants to rotate and stay in the original orientation? Well, that angle that is rotating that this bar appears to be rotating over the device. That is the angle that we're looking for. That is the angle that we should be able to calculate this uh, gyroscope moving due to the rotation of the Earth underneath us. So without further ado, let's get on to the test. So I've just attached the motor there. Um, it actually takes four AA batteries to power it um, and I've run this test quite a number of times now and put quite a few batteries through it so I kind of know how long they're going to last and what well, sort of I've sound I've sped up the actual motor. experiment because I think it's important for you to see the whole six minutes so I've sped it up a bit yeah, so you can see it. It's important to see the whole six minutes because, you know, just in case any journalists are in here uh, thinking that I'm, uh, you know, just, just making up stuff, you've got to see, you know, the whole six minutes. But, yeah, we'll spit it up. Let's get up to speed now. I'm going to remove the motor. And replace it with the, the piece of play dough to get it perfectly balanced. Now I'm going to demonstrate some precession by gently pressing on the, uh, the horizontal bar there. And now I'm going to sort of line it up the best I can so that you cannot see the, um, the, bra the brass flywheel from above. And it's as it's sort of um, straight up and down as possible. So if we just take note of where we are now, at, um, you can see a zero on the top right, just to the top to the right of the bar. You can see a zero is there, and you'll note that you cannot see the brass um, flywheel from above now. So we are sort of dead centre above it. So now it's just a waiting game. So while we wait, um, let's just have a look at a brief history of the gyroscope. In early times, people discovered the spinning top, a toy with a unique ability to balance upright while rotating rapidly. At the time, sailors relied on sextants for navigation, measuring the angle between specific stars and the horizon. In the 19th century, Fleuret created a top that was continuously powered by sextants. Sorry, I feel like I have to show the whole six minutes. The wheel. You know, sped up, but been used for thousands of gyros since. Just so you see, it's not the first modern gyroscope was designed in the early 1800s by Johann Gottlieb Freilich von Bernberger, a professor at the University of Tübingen in Germany. It was made with a heavy ball instead of a wheel, but since it had no scientific application, it faded into history. In the mid 19th century, the spinning top acquired the name gyroscope, though not through its use as a navigational tool. French scientist Leon Foucault 
had experimented with a long, heavy pendulum in an attempt to observe the rotation of the Earth. The pendulum was set swinging back and forth along the north-south plane, while the Earth turned beneath it. Foucault corroborated the observation by using a spinning top in a similar manner. He placed a wheel, rotating at high speed, in a supporting ring in such a way. So going back to the test, we've exceeded six minutes now and there's no observable movement. You can still see the zero to the right of the bar in its entirety, and you still cannot see the brass flywheel from above. So how much should the gyro have precessed? What angle should the gyro's axis have moved? The calculation is the sine of the latitude times 15 degrees per hour. Micron latitude is exactly 53.06 degrees north. So the angle in which the gyro should have moved in six minutes is 1.2 degrees. Now this doesn't sound a lot, but let's assume that Leon Foucault's experiments were performed in Paris. He should have seen even less based on his uh, latitude. And let's not forget that he didn't have an electric motor spinning his gyro up to 9,000 RPM. So one of the proofs out there about the spinning Earth is um, Foucault's um, experiments with his gyroscope. A wooden gyroscope that he used a, a pull string to get going. Okay? Now, Rob Durham was using a, uh, a precision you know, um, gyroscope with, made with uh, you know, top quality brass and, and perfectly balanced and everything with an electric motor. And yet, he couldn't replicate what apparently Foucault discovered. And uh, all this idea is, is basically based on. Now, how many of you have heard of Aries failure? Okay, all right. Keep your hands up. How many of you actually understand what Aries failure is, is about? Put your hands down. And, Come on, be honest. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to uh, I'm going to play it anyway for those who, who don't know. So, um, this is one of the actually one of the first um, uh, videos I've watched that kind of pushed me towards flat Earth um, because even though this guy Malcolm Bowden. Um, doesn't believe in the flat Earth, and he's actually come out against it and everything. You know, he's actually saying that the Earth is stationary, you know, and and here's the proof of it. If a telescope is pointing at a star, and both are stationary, then obviously the light comes straight into the telescope. In 1729, Bradley found that he had to tip his telescope forward very slightly to get a star in the centre of his telescope. It was assumed that this was due to the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Let us assume that the telescope was moving at 5 miles an hour and had to be tipped 5 degrees. This 5 degree tipping, however, could equally be caused by the ether moving at 5 miles an hour carrying the stars <coughs> around the Earth. As we see here, the light would be coming in at the same angle and the telescope would still have to be tipped 5 degrees. So tipping the telescope does not tell us whether it is the starlight moving or the telescope moving. However, there is a simple experiment that can determine whether it was the Earth that was moving or the ether and starlight. All that you had to do was record the tipping required for any particular star, then fill the telescope with water, which greatly slows down the speed of light in the telescope. <coughs> so here is the moving telescope filled with water, tipped at 5 degrees, and you can see that the starlight does not now reach the eyepiece at the bottom. This is because the starlight moves much more slowly when passing through water. However, if the telescope is tipped further, say 10 degrees, then the starlight will then be visible again in the eyepiece. It has to be tipped further because the light is now slower when in the telescope. But if the starlight is going past the telescope at 5 mile an hour, then when it is filled with water, no further tipping is needed 
because the light is coming in at 5 degrees anyway. The starlight stays on the same path but is only travelling slower in the water. To recap, if it is the telescope that is moving, then when it is filled with water, it has to be tipped further to see the star. If the telescope is stationary and the starlight drifting past us, then it does not have to be tipped further. In 1871, George Biddle Airy, the Astronomer Royal, performed this experiment. This is a copy from his original report. You can see that the two readings are virtually identical. If it had been the telescope that was moving, Airy expected a figure of 30 seconds of arc. In fact, he only managed to read 0.8 seconds of arc difference. So, right there is, is absolute proof that it's, it's the stars that are moving and not the Earth. And this is why it's called Airy's failure because he, he failed to, to dis, uh, discover the Earth's motion. Yeah? But it's, it's a bit of psychological programming, really. So it's called a failure so that people would discount it. And consequently, no scientists ever get told about Aries failure. Yeah? This is one of those uh, independent viewpoints that, uh, you know, if we go back to the train analogy, it's like uh, seeing a sign on the, on, on the platform. Well, you see the sign, now you know which one's moving, yeah? So, so this is one of those, one of those independent uh, points of reference. And it's not the only one. Um, there have been several um, experiments that show that, uh, you know, conclusively that the Earth isn't moving. Um, and the last one, the uh, um, cosmic background, micro background radiation, was the, uh, the subject of a film called The Principle. And uh, I'm just going to uh, play you a section um, from an interview with uh, Dr. R Robertson Jennis, somebody I had a bit of a debate with. Um, but uh, we'll play that one. If everything is moving, in other words, all the stars in the, in the universe are moving, how can we possibly determine if we are the center of this moving universe? Over the past decade or so, we have seen out to the very limits of the observable cosmos. We've mapped its largest structure, the cosmic microwave background, the oldest light in the universe according to the standard Big Bang model of cosmology. What we have discovered is shocking. On the very largest scale, we see a pattern of really big hot and cold spots which line up around a special axis, which has been dubbed the axis of evil. And that's quite puzzling. Why is there a special direction in space? Well, you know, it, it's interesting that you asked that because in 2009 they set up a probe called the Planck probe. He just came back with the results in 2013 in March. I don't know if you heard about it or not. No. The European Space Agency set it up in cooperation with NASA. This was the third attempt that they had to nullify the data that they were finding in the cosmic microwave background radiation that permeates the whole universe, that the Earth was in the center of the universe. The first one they set up was in 1990 called the COBE probe. It came back, sure, the Earth was in the center. The WMAP was the second one in 2001, came back with the same data. And what they tried to do was say that this was all an error. There was some kind of misreading or it was, uh, there was contamination in the apparatus or the sky or whatever. So they set up a third probe in 2009, just came back in 2013. Guess what? Same exact results. Same exact results and what were the interpretations? Well, the Earth has to be in the center of the universe. And we have somebody quoted in our book, Lawrence Krauss of the Arizona State University, who says, yeah, this means we're in the center of the universe. Let's, let's pick up on that point a bit. And you mentioned that the background radiation, microwave radiation in the universe, supplied data from which it became apparent that the Earth was, in fact, at the center of a moving universe. Explain why that is so. Why do, why do these data confirm that? Okay. 
Well, the Big Bang Theory predicts that there was an explosion 13.7 billion years ago, okay? So if there was an explosion, then that means the explosion had to come out equal, equal on all sides of the sphere. It had to be what they call homogeneous, okay? And that's naturally accepted. It's like homogenized milk. Sure. You, know, you shake that thing up and you can't, you can't see one place from another place. It's all homogenized. And that's what they needed for this Big Bang universe. What they found when they sent these three probes up, yeah, some of it was homogeneous, but it's like having a bowl full of jello with two swords going through the middle of the jello. What are the swords? The swords are the orientation of the cosmic microwave background radiation throughout the universe. Well, what do you mean by the orientation? Okay, there's, there's hot and cold spots they found. It's not homogeneous. There's hot and cold spots in this microwave background radiation, and if you align all these cold spots, it forms an X through the whole universe. Unbelievable. And guess what's in the middle? Oh, you're kidding. No. This is what the data shows. This is what okay, the data come shows. On. Oh, what, what, what mainstream publication recognizes The this? University of Michigan, Dragon Hutterer, Craig Copey, uh, Glenn Starkman. These are all the guys who have done all the work on this microwave radiation. They write in their papers. They write one in 2004, 2008, 2010, and 2012, and they're writing another one on the Planck probe. So you're saying these space probes were designed to explain away the X represented by the hot and cold spots. They wanted spots. to make sure it wasn't an accident. Okay, so there were how many probes in three? Three in 20 years. And you're saying that all three confirmed what then? That the Earth is in the center of the universe. On the basis of the hot and cold spots, yes. whose alignment represents an X. An X. And at the center of the X is the Earth. Right. And they call that X the axis of evil. That was coined. Scientists call that the axis of evil. Call that the axis of evil. <laughs> Um, I've just, well, first of all, they, they tell us, you know, the motion of stars, motion of the universe, you know, proves that we are spinning, okay? Now, I've just shown you um, several experiments that, uh, that disprove that. And you, you can bet the scientists don't get to hear about this, this stuff. You know, if they do, if they know about it, they're, they're willfully ignoring it, okay? So let's see what um, my friend Richards has to say about it. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. It's wrong. You know, the, the, you know we've, I've just shown you experiments. That, and, you know, science is about saying, okay, if we see something that doesn't match up to our model, our model has to go. But they're not following the scientific uh, principle. So, we're told that this is our, our solar system, okay? And bear in mind, all the measurements and uh, observations seem to confirm this kind of model, yeah? So, you know, when we look through telescopes, all the planets are, are, are arrayed along what they call the plane of the ecliptic. So there's like one plane which all the planets go around in. In fact, I think there's two planets that don't quite do that, Mercury and uh, um, I think it's Neptune. One of them, they, they sort of slightly off. But, uh, but this generally is what they're saying is, is going on. So how can this align with that? Okay? Now think about it, yeah? The, the, the sun's moving and all the, all the planets are supposedly in that plane of motion Yet they're all moving as, as like a, a, a whole system, a plate, <laughs> yeah? So just to you know, think about this a bit further, imagine, imagine this scenario. So imagine I've got like a sun on a, on a piece of string and uh, all these planets um, are connected by some elastic, elastic band, okay? So if I was to pull up on that string, okay, we're told that the speed of gravity is the speed of light, right? Right? Yeah. Oh, come on! Yeah, nice. <laughs> so, according to that, if I started pulling on that piece of string, it would take uh, 3.2 minutes before Mercury would, would realize something had changed, <clears throat> right? So, and, and eight minutes before Earth noticed it. 
and so on and so on. So you'd get a cone effect. You wouldn't get the plane, you'd get a cone because they'd take different times to start responding. Yeah? So also, since you've got a, a, a pull inwards, if there's motion that way, there'll be motion of the, the, start of the, the planet inwards. Just like, you know, if you imagine you pulled something up, all the, everything that's connected would start moving towards the center, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? So eventually, you should get this. You wouldn't get the planets moving in a, in a, in a plane, they'd just be in a string, sort of following the sun. You know, am I, am I sort of just making this up? I mean, <laughs> you know? But we, you know, this is not what we see. You know, this is what makes sense to my mind. Their model doesn't make sense to me. You've got gravity. Sorry? You've got gravity. Well, that is gravity. You know, I'm just, I'm just extrapolating what, what they're saying using the information that they've told us. They've told us the speed of gravity. You know? You know, they, they make these, these uh, graphics showing if the sun disappeared, it would take minutes before the planets would notice it. And I'm just, you know, I'm just expanding it for what they're telling us is real. So one of the things that uh, I hear often about, uh, you know, the, the rotation of the Earth is that, you know, of course you wouldn't feel it because the Earth's only going round, you know, once a day. It's far too slow for you to feel it. Yeah? Anybody else heard that one? Yes. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, yeah, if you're on a... Uh, a roundabout, and that roundabout is eight feet across. Yeah, the motion will be three sixteenths of an inch every minute. You wouldn't, you wouldn't even detect it. You'd have to sit there and look at it, and ah, yeah, I see it. Yeah. Okay. So imagine if you um, sort of widen that um, to a mile wide. Okay. Now you've got a roundabout a mile wide. That roundabout, if it was going round once a day, once every twenty-four hours, would be moving at two point two inches. Uh, a second, so it'd be like this, easily detectable. Yeah. Now let's uh, expand it to the width of the of the Earth. Okay. So now it will be moving at 1,037 uh, miles an hour. Yeah. 50 or uh, 1,521 feet per second. I mean, yes, you would notice it. Contrast that with the gravitron. Anybody been on the gravitron? <laughs> Yeah, come on, anyone been on the Gravitron? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so you know that when that thing goes around, you're like, you know, <laughs> okay? It only spins at 24 miles an hour. <laughs> 24 miles an hour, yeah? And, um, and sorry, sorry, 24. Yeah, 24 revolutions a minute, 37 miles an hour. 37 miles an hour, that's nothing compared to 1,000 miles an hour, yeah? So, but, you know, it's just a, that they, they're using this train idea again. It's, you know, you can't test it for yourself. You know, you have to believe what they, they tell you. This is also what would happen. And I think Iru mentioned this as well. If you spin a ball um, with water in it, or on it, yeah, the water would collect at the poles, at uh, the poles, it collects at the equator, and then shoot off at the equator. So, um, why is there land at the equator? Because if that's the case, it's the Earth spinning at a thousand miles an hour and only gravity is holding the water to the Earth, the water would still bulge at the equator. So why is there land at the equator? Anybody got an answer? I asked this to Neil deGrasse Tyson, he still has an answer to me. <laughs> the, the other thing that uh, many people would say is, well, if you're on a, a train, and the train's moving at a constant speed, well, of course you won't feel anything because you're moving at a constant speed and uh, it will feel natural to you. You won't even know you're moving. Well, the problem with that is that uh, science, science tells us that motion in a circle is acceleration in different directions. Yeah? So this is, this is I just took that off of uh, Google. Yeah? The motion of an object in a circle at a constant speed, uh, the, an object, sorry, an object moving in a circle is accelerating. Yeah? So, so you absolutely do feel acceleration. So let's do a little experiment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'll take it some of you have seen this. <laughs> disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> so, um, we'll have a quick look at the uh, Coriolis effect. Yeah. Um, again, uh, Iru um, talks about this, so I'm not going to sort of go on too long about this. Um, so, they tell <coughs> us that, uh, you know, artillery shells, um, Missiles and, uh, and all sorts of you know, uh, sniper bullets all get affected by this Coriolis effect. Well, I did a little video a few years ago um, to show what would happen if snipers had to uh, compensate for the Coriolis effect. Okay, hold still now. This is for bomb gear. Old time on the Average muzzle velocity for a SB40 sure kill. That would be in your ballistic table, sir. No, no, I, I don't have my ballistic tables. Okay, I'll look that up for you. I'm kind of in a hurry here, so don't put me on. Oh, please. oh shit. <laughs> No, uh, exploding toilet seats? Really? How much? Uh, no, no, uh, no. It's okay. Thank you. Okay. You have a nice day now. One thousand twenty-four feet per second. That's perfect. I have you now, Obama. What? Where'd he go? Shit! 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 So, um, this is again some experimental proof that uh, the, the Coriolis effect has no effect whatsoever. You know, it's just a, an idea. This is the Navy's railgun, and uh, it can sight 
and, and hit targets 100 miles away. Yeah? It uses a laser to, to target um, you know, its target, and um, then it works out its elevation and, uh, and fires and hits the target. Now, if you, if you actually sat down and worked out how that does that, then it, it, there's no way it could ever hit a target without taking the Coriolis effect into, into consideration. Um, you know, the fact that it sights it the laser tells you right there that there is no such thing as a Coriolis effect. Earth is constantly spinning around its axis from west to east. But because Earth is a sphere and wider in the middle, points on the equator are actually spinning faster around the axis than points near the poles. So imagine you were standing in Texas and had a magic paper airplane that could travel hundreds of miles. If you threw your airplane directly northward, you might think it would land straight north, maybe somewhere in Nebraska. But Texas is actually spinning around Earth's axis faster than Nebraska is because it's closer to the equator. That means that the paper airplane is spinning faster as well. And when you throw it, that spinning momentum is conserved. So if you threw your paper airplane in a straight line toward the north, it would land somewhere to the right of Nebraska, maybe in Delaware. So from your point of view in Texas, the plane would have taken a curved path to the right. So you notice they use the idea of a paper aeroplane and not a real one, because it would obviously apply to a real aeroplane as well. But you don't get planes aiming north to go east. <laughs> Doesn't happen, does it? So, so it's, it's, it's rubbish. I was going to say bullshit. I don't think I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> right, so... Um, I'm going to have to hurry, but uh, right, one of the things we asked is about, you know, for you know, helicopters, or we ask, helicopter is hovering, why don't, doesn't it just, uh, just sit there and wait for the Earth to, to spin around it? Um, so they say that the, the Earth is moving a thousand miles an hour this way, and we're going to use that, the idea of a Harry jump jet, yeah? So when the Harry jump jet is hovering, well, the Earth is moving a thousand miles an hour that way, the atmosphere is moving a thousand miles an hour that way, and that must mean the, hot, the Harrier jump jet is also moving a thousand miles an hour backwards. Yeah, that's their model. Right, fair enough. Okay, let's, let's go with that. So I'm going to look from above. So that's, this is the same sort of uh, graphic, but from above. Okay, so let's imagine now that the jet starts moving at a thousand miles an hour that way. Okay, <laughs> according to their model, that jet is stationary now, okay, so it's overcome its inertia going backwards, and now it's stationary with the Earth moving at a thousand miles an hour and the atmosphere moving at a thousand miles an hour, okay? Everyone with me? Yes. Okay, so with that, from that point of view, now if that plane turned north, all of a sudden it's going to counter thousand miles an hour winds going this way, <laughs> and this is the only result that can happen. It's, you know, it's, again, two models that look identical, but there's a, a distinguishing feature, and it's the wind speed there that's a distinguishing feature. Um, I'm going to end with this, because apparently I'm under pressure. Um, yeah, so I don't know if everyone's seen this. They've now um, admitted that the moon is in the Earth's atmosphere. Yay! You know, so so we didn't really go anywhere special. We could have gone to Basildon, or you know, it's like we didn't. Even, it was still in the Earth's atmosphere. So where did we go? Um, but if you think about it, there are um, a few problems with this idea. Right? The SR seventy one Blackbird, top speed two thousand two hundred miles an hour. Right? But when it goes to that speed, it heats up to six hundred degrees Fahrenheit, three hundred degrees centigrade. So, if the moon is in the Earth's atmosphere, well, shouldn't it heat up? Even though they say, well, the atmosphere thins out, it will still encounter friction from that air, which means the moon cannot be in this um, perfectly balanced situation where it turns at the exact same speed as its, uh, as its rotation, so the, the, uh, the face always faces Earth. Yeah? It will start to slow down. 
Yeah? So how can it maintain that same, that same attitude? It's impossible. Yeah? Even the fact that the moon is moving away from us yeah, means that its orbit is getting bigger, which means it's going to slow down. <coughs> so it means that the, the moon should start turning around so we see the backside of it. Does everybody follow that? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, so again, impossible. I think this is the last thing, this is the last one anyway, so. and now they're putting out um, newer versions that, that are right. But they can't get rid of the stuff that they made before, which is wrong. So, you know, it, we, we can tell it's, it's all, I'm going to use it, bullshit. It's wrong. I received an email from a retired F-16 pilot whose name is Mike. His new YouTube name is F.E. Viper 16. A good name, so watch for him in the comments. I spoke to Mike on the phone today, but he wishes to remain anonymous, and I will certainly honor that. Again, if you are a professional and would like to talk to me about the unique perspective of the Flat Earth related to your expertise, please email me at tabooconspiracy at gmail.com. I will always keep your information confidential if that is what you want. I do hope this information will lead to more flat earth investigations because these radar systems and the aircraft using them are fascinating and the flat earth evidences they introduce are indisputable. I wish I could share my full discussion with Mike because it was awesome as this retired Air Force pilot confirmed that he definitely flew over a flat and stationary earth and that none of the systems of his aircraft were designed with the curvature in mind. Now, I might make some mistakes here, and I do apologize for that, as the information was complex for me, but Mike did say that he might stick around and answer your legitimate questions in the comment section. An F-16 can fly up to 1,500 miles per hour, and may be intercepting another craft flying in the opposite direction at the same or a different altitude at similar speeds. Breaking it down, 1,500 miles per hour is 250 miles in just 10 minutes. As Mike discovered, the paramount problem with the globe is 8 inches per mile squared. The infamous and quite accurate formula that calculates the alleged curvature drop if the globe were real. That easy to understand formula absolutely destroys the globe because no one has seen or accounts for that insane amount of curvature drop ever. But for an F-16 flying at 1,500 miles per hour, that would be a curvature adjustment of approximately 42,000 feet in just 10 minutes. But no pilot makes that ridiculous curvature adjustment. But think about the problem when an F-16 is quickly intercepting another aircraft coming from the other direction. Consider the unbelievable amount of curvature adjustments that would be necessary for an Air Force pilot on an intercept. And yet, Air Force pilots never learned about the curvature drop in training or otherwise, as confirmed by Mike. What's also fascinating is the fact that Air Force pilots learn and experience it daily that when a distant aircraft is at the horizon, it is at the same altitude. If the distant aircraft is above the horizon, then the pilot knows the aircraft is higher. And if the distant aircraft is below the horizon, then the aircraft is at a lower altitude. I think this photograph shows what I'm talking about. 
you can see which balloons are higher and lower based on the horizon line. There's more proof that the horizon does indeed rise with eye level, which is an absolute impossibility under the globe. But getting back to the non-existent curvature adjustments, the globe propagandists would probably answer that the aircraft automatically adjusts because of some magical force of gravity, automatically pulling the nose down of the aircraft to strangely maintain equal altitude, or that the varying air pressure densities keep the aircraft at the same altitude. I've heard both of these silly explanations, but that brings us to Mike's information. This is with respect to the AN-APG-68 Long Range Radar System. It has a range up to 184 miles. Here's a picture of what the operation screen looks like in the cockpit of an F-16. This will make more sense in a little bit. Essentially, as an F-16 pilot, Mike would fly with a wingman or maybe three other F-16s in formation. Each pilot, using his radar system, would then have the responsibility to sweep a key portion of the sky in front of the aircraft based on the F-16's position. This is for maximum efficiency. For example, if there were two F-16s in formation, the one on the left would sweep a section of the sky on the left. The F-16 on the right would sweep a section of the sky on the right. Makes sense, right? These aircraft don't sweep the entire sky, but only a key angled segment of the sky, like 60 degrees up, 60 degrees down, 60 degrees to the left, or 60 degrees to the right. So if, say, four F-16s are in formation, one pilot may have the duty to sweep his radar looking for aircraft at 10,000 feet and above on the right side. Do you see the problem yet? What is a radar sweep at 10,000 feet on the alleged globe at 80 miles ahead because 10,000 feet at Mike's point of view would not be 10,000 feet 80 miles ahead of the enemy's position? In actuality, that aircraft would be much higher than 10,000 feet than what the F-16's radar would indicate if we lived on a globe. Instead, the computer radar system is based on a flat map. None of the radar readings would be accurate and enemy aircraft would exploit these problems all the time if we lived on a globe. Just think about it. How could you lock, track, and acquire an enemy aircraft when the height curvature adjustments would throw the whole matter into disarray? Here's a short four minute clip from an online tutorial for an F-16 simulator that talks about how the F-16 radar system works. But I think it'll help you understand Mike's information, but you're welcome to skip ahead four minutes if you're impatient. We are positioned here looking that way, range, Zero, a quarter, half, three quarters, full. And that depends on our range scale here. So if we were on 80, that's 80 miles, 60 miles, 40 miles, 20 miles. If we were on 10 miles, 10, uh, seven and a half, five, two and a half, and so on. So currently azimuth is six. This is the width of the slice of cake, the width of the scan bone. That means 60 degrees to the left, 60 degrees to the right. If we now go to a3 it's now 30 degrees to the left 30 degrees to the right total 60 degrees the limits are shown by that line there and that line there now if I were to move my cursor off the edge you can see it follows where I go to the max limits of the radar uh, the bump stops they're called 60 here 60 degrees there if we want to go again we can go to 10 degrees 20 degrees total and you can see we can move left and we can move right all the way to the bump stops let's put it back on 60. at this point you might think well why would you not always have it on full width well the reason is because of the refresh rate with the the b sweep that is the b sweep at the bottom there going right and left and right and left remember every time it goes hits the bump stop it goes down a notch hits the bump stop goes down a notch in terms of elevation until it's finished its bar its elevation bars the bigger the wider you scan and the more bars you have the bigger your refresh rate is the harder it is to keep contacts on screen and it is an absolute art form um, to keep um, contacts on screen and balance the, your situational awareness with your ability to see and track targets. So that's as of now we have our elevation, the thickness of our slice of cake. How many bars do we want it? Remember, each bar is about. It depends on different radars. They're usually about five, three to five degrees. Uh, we've got four bars at the moment, so that means um, four bounces between bump stops, four B sweeps before it resets. We can have one we can have two so this will give us the maximum size elevation this will give us the smallest size this will give them the medium size 
but the bigger the size is, the lower the refresh rate, the harder it is going to gonna be to lock, track, acquire and keep a track of these targets. Okay, M3 uh, doesn't do anything at the moment. So next we've got our carrot. We've got our azimuth carrot or our B-sweep. That's this guy here. That is where the antenna is pointing. 60 degrees left, 60 degrees right is where the bomb stops are. This is our elevation. So that you see it will go down in four bars, then back up to the top. And this is, this radar can handle 60 degrees left, 60 degrees right, 60 degrees up, 60 degrees down. So this is zero degrees azimuth, this is zero degrees elevation. That is up there somewhere, 60 degrees up, 60 degrees down. If we want to change our ele avatar elevation, then I'm going to press the button and we can move it up here like that. And down, we want to move it down, whoops, wrong button, we can move it down there like that. Look how, if I aim it down, these uh, contacts disappear. These contacts have disappeared, they're now fading. And that's because my slice of cake is aimed too far down and it's below them. If I want to regain them, because I know they're roughly co out of you, then I move to the middle and we'll start picking them up after a couple of sweeps. Okay. Now, I know what you're thinking. I can know what angle this elevation is set to, but in real terms, what actual altitude is that set to? And that's where these two numbers here, you'll be using these two all the time. Note that wherever I move this cursor, these two numbers change. You will always be looking at them. What they are saying is at the range that I've got this cursor set, which currently is 40 miles. Remember, we're on 80 miles there, so 80 miles there, zero miles there, 40 miles there. At 40 miles, if I drew a plumb line, that is a vertical up to down line, through our slice of cake, our scan zone, at 40 miles distant from me, it would intersect, that plumb line would intercept the top of the scan zone at 54,000 feet ASL, and at the bottom, minus 5,000 feet ASL theoretical. I don't want to bore you much longer, so let's get to Mike's email. I have a bit of knowledge from my days as an F-16 pilot that I need to share with someone. I respect your work and thought you might be another great person to pass this to. I don't have, nor do I want, a platform, so here you go. If you decide to verify what I'm telling you and have questions, feel free to contact me here. This will be tough to illustrate with words, but I'll try. The F-16 has a radar called an APG-68. At least it did 18 years ago when I last flew it. The radar, in air-to-air -air mode, has the ability to scan forward plus or minus 60 degrees of the nose, 120 degrees, plus a back-and-forth elevation selectable of one, two, or four bars or rows. In other words, in one bar, it simply sweeps level relative to the aircraft bank back and forth at the same elevation. In two bar, it sweeps all the way, then drops a certain amount to sweep back, thereby doubling the volume of airspace searched. In four bar, it does the twice, doubling it again. Think of the radar beam as pointing a flashlight. The elevation of the sweeps are pilot controllable. The pilot can tell what the elevation of the sweeps are in the display. At the cursor position, the top and bottom altitudes of coverage are displayed at the range of the cursor, and this altitude is controllable with the L strobe, a little wheel on the throttle. We use this because if my search responsibility is 10,000 feet and above, I can roll up and cover my area more efficiently. I know this is probably clear as mud, but bear with me. Obviously, you can determine the width of the sweeps at various ranges of your search. In other words, the distance between the sides of your scope. If I run the cursor out to 80 miles, isosceles triangle math gives you 138 miles from side to side. Curvature math gives you a hump on my nose of 12,700 feet. In other words, if I roll up to search 10,000 and above and set that in the center of the scope, I'd be 22,700 feet and above on the sides of my scope, right? Well, non-practice. If I run my cursor out to any distance, the display shows the same on the left side, middle, and right. So my conclusion is the engineers are going to get fighter pilots shot down because they didn't take into account the curvature of the Earth, bastards, or the Earth is flat. That's it. That's Mike's email. I hope that was semi-understandable. The globe simply doesn't exist in reality, and now we have a retired F-16 pilot who confirms the same. Hope you enjoyed the video. Love to all. Yo, what's up, peeps? Uh, if you're a flat earther and you're already awake to the globe deception, you've probably already seen this. Uh, this is for the, the globe trolls that are in my chat telling me that artillery and stuff proves the spin of the earth and blah, blah, blah. So here we go. NASA documents admitting the earth is flat and stationary. 
the derivation and definition of a linear aircraft model. In the introduction, they flat out say right here, the rep this report documents the derivation, which means the origin, and the definition of linear aircraft model for a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating Earth. Everybody see that? Derivation means the origin. Definition means this is, this is how it's defined. This is how it works. So they're talking about the equations. And they, I mean, you want to talk about the calculus and trig this thing gets into. The equations are based on these airplanes flying over a non-rotating flat earth. Question, why would this be in any technical manual of anybody if it doesn't exist? I mean, think about it. They claim the Coriolis effect that, that snipers have to, to uh, calculate the, the spinning of the earth, the Coriolis effect, when they're shooting at, you know, a thousand yard shot or something. Yet, they don't have to for Mach 1, 2, 3, 4 aircraft. You don't have to calculate the spin. No, no, no. This is just about, we, the, these planes fly over non-rotating flat earth. So, oh, well, Pastor Dean, this is what I heard. Oh, well, that, they're just doing that to simplify the equations. Oh, oh, really? I'm sorry. I didn't know that NASA rocket scientists and MIT mathematicians couldn't factor in 8 inches per mile squared. I'm sorry. They have to simplify the math. I'm, maybe they missed a class at MIT or something. I don't know. But this is, this is crazy. Now, you can try to dismiss this if you want to, but it's also... Uh, in the conclusion, the concluding remarks of the report and all the math in the equations. Look at that. This report derives and defines a set linearized system matrices for rigid aircraft of constant mass flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating earth. I didn't write that. It seems that someone at NASA is a flat earther. Oh, my God. Right? How can this be? Now, they have to design stuff for it to work the way things are. That's why. Let's keep going here. There's your definition of derivation. Obtaining or developing something from a source of origin. Why, why would you develop the equations for aircraft to fly over something that doesn't exist? Oh, let's factor in the unicorn equation just in case the Pegasus, the flying horse equation. So, yeah. Now, they're telling you it exists. Definition, of course, is a statement of the exact meaning of something. Think about that. So I thought that was big when I found that. Cosmic, 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 cosmic. Every time I'm signing on, they always ramble on. Speaking Babylon in their mind be usable. Mark inscribed and blind to some. Claiming wise and proving up. Oh my lord, I think I need a break. Yeah, academic BS in the way. Filling up the anger every day. Wait, don't you know that Jesus is the way? Hey, you're no different than the rat. Laugh. Evolutionary lies, the demon in disguise. Knowledge art is flat. Flat. Truth is seen as crazy mind. Let go and seek the Christ. What you talking about? You whack. Smack. The world will burn you on the cross Please know your work ain't lost You're no different than a rat Laugh Evolutionary lies Science warping minds I'm sick and tired of the lies that were told They getting mad I ain't bow to their rule Jesus Christ conquered death in the light Oh we'll know like a thief in the night <laughs> Don't be scared Life is great with no fear the string detached, that now king of the air. He will fall in the abyss that will go. 
If you put that way, surely death now is no meaning. Stop, back up, think on the word. It's written on your heart, haven't you heard? Everyone will get the chance to make a choice. Eternal last, as the first will walk and grow. Consuming light, immortal glow. Will all be known? That I highly doubt. Work and praise the doubt. Cause why you meditate and seeking God? They plotting in the darkness with no love and rather heartless. Every time I'm signing on, they always ramble on. Speaking Babylon in the mind Beelzebub. Thinking lies, thought is numb. Zombie eyes, scared and run. Oh my lord, I think I need a break. Yeah, academic BS in the way. Ah, filling up the anger every day. Wait, don't you know that Jesus is the way? Hey, you're no different than a rat. Laugh. Evolutionary lies, the demon in disguise. Knowledge earth is flat, flat. Truth is seen as crazy mind. Let go and seek the Christ. What you talking about? You whack, smack. The world will burn you on the cross. Please know your work ain't lost. You're no different than a rat. Evolutionary lies, science warping minds.